The remote desktop session fires up, the technician can see the screen, can move the mouse, and this is when the malware activates. Hello, and welcome to Waterfall's Industrial Security Institute. I'm Andrew Ginter with Waterfall Security Solutions, and we are working our way through the top 20 cyber attacks on industrial control systems. In this series, we're using the top 20 attacks as a measuring stick, as a way to compare the strength of security posture for two security programs at a hypothetical water treatment plant. One is vintage 2013, a lot of software best practices, whatever was you know, advised in, in 2013, yes, you know, the, the plant has done that. The second posture is that same software-based 2013 vintage advice with a piece of modern technology which is a unidirectional security gateway replacing the ITOT firewall. The only connection from the industrial network to the IT network is the unidirectional gateway. And the question we address in today's video is, does either of these security programs reliably defeat, 100% of the time, reliably defeat today's attack, which is two-factor session hijacking. Today's attack scenario is a nasty one. A lot of industrial sites have remote access enabled. Um, 2013 best practice says you want remote access, you should have a jump host. The jump host should be the termination point of your VPN. You need remote access encrypted. There should be two-factor authentication, strong passwords, antivirus, you know, software updates, security updates. The jump host should be hardened every way known to humankind. Make it a hard target. Our attackers want to get into this industrial site through the jump host. So instead of targeting the IT network, instead of targeting the jump host somehow magically indirectly through the IT network, our attackers target technicians who they know are authorized to log into the jump host because of social media posts, because of whatever research they've done. They target these technicians with spear phishing attacks. They do their homework, they craft very convincing emails, and they persuade the technician to download and run malware on their laptops. The malware connects to a command and control center. So it, you know, it, it sets itself up to get the latest software updates for the malware from the command and control center and waits. The malware waits. It waits until the technician has turned on the VPN. The technician might be at a conference, might be in a hotel room, might be connected to the hotel network. The technician remotely fires up the VPN, connects out to the hotel internet, and connects into the IT network and into the jump host. We have an encrypted connection all the way through to the jump host. Now the jump host challenges the technician and says, are you who you say you are? I need an account name, I need a password, I need my two-factor dongle, whether it be a, a fingerprint or uh, you know, an RSA-style dongle with a, a crypto key in it that changes once a minute. The technician logs in to the jump host legitimately. The technician has all of these permissions. The remote desktop session fires up, the technician can see the screen, can move the mouse, and this is when the malware activates. The malware creates a virtual screen. I mean, if you've ever used a, uh, a USB device to connect to an extra monitor, I mean, I do this all the time. I have these things sitting at home. I connect my laptop to a USB monitor. The software creates another monitor in the head of the operating system. And the, uh, the malware moves the remote desktop window from the laptop screen over to this fictional monitor. To the technician, the window disappears. You know, where did my remote desktop go? And the malware puts up a useful error message, something like, remote desktop has stopped responding. Click here to solve the problem. And so the technician clicks, and it's a very slow click. Everything starts slowing down, clicks and clicks, nothing happens. Technician picks up the phone, calls IT, reams them out. I can't get my job done. This takes tens of minutes. For the whole time, the attacker has been operating the remote desktop window remotely through the technician's laptop over the internet, from the laptop through the VPN connection into the jump host, and from the jump host into the industrial target, doing whatever, planting ransomware, planting a rat, uh, you know, remote access Trojan, what, whatever the, the attacker wants to do. 
In terms of sophistication, this attack is very sophisticated. Uh, I have never seen this kind of remote access session hijacking software for a remote desktop type of user interface. Uh, there's been lots of software done for remote session hijacking for browsers, but not so much for the, the remote desktop class of tools. So this is a new tool that the, the bad guys would have to invent. Um, so they've got to you know, have some money behind them. They've got to be willing to invest to produce this attack tool. In terms of engineering sophistication, well, these attackers can do what they like on the network. If their engineering sophistication is low, they can drop some ransomware and score a half million dollars of, of ransom, you know, they hope. If their engineering sophist sophistication is high, they can damage equipment, they can cause malfunctions, they can cause fictional malfunctions so they can manipulate commodities markets, and so on. So there's a whole range of, of consequences depending on the degree of engineering sophistication from these class of attackers. When it comes to our two security postures, does either posture reliably defeat this class of attack? Well, if we look at the, the 2013 security program with the jump host and the two-factor authentication, how's it going to defeat this? The malware is on a legitimate technician's laptop. If the malware is low volume, if you know the world has seen only a few copies, there's going to be no antivirus signatures for this. The, the antivirus system is not going to catch this malware. Um, if the technician fails to click on a link and download, well, then the attack fails. But uh, experience proves, statistics show that even the best trained individuals will still click on 4 or 5% of the carefully crafted phishing attacks that come after them. 4 or 5% is not zero. So the technician's laptop is not reliably defended. And the industrial network, you know, the technician has the credentials to log in to the industrial network. Intrusion detection, what's intrusion detection going to see here? Intrusion detection is going to see the technician logging in and doing things that technicians do, reprogramming PLCs. This is what technicians do. This is normal for this class of remote user. Intrusion detection, I don't even think is going to fire here. So no, the classic 2013 uh, security posture is the posture this attack was designed to defeat. So of course it does not reliably defeat this class of attack. In the unidirectionally protected uh, industrial network, is that network at risk? Well, in that network, the remote desktop style of remote access doesn't happen. Um, the most popular kind of remote access for those unidirectionally protected industrial networks where the only connection from one side to the other is a remote screen view connection. I mean, there's other kinds of technology, but that's the most popular. Remote screen view sends pictures of the screen of, let's say, an engineering workstation or an HMI workstation, whatever you need, out through the hardware, the one-way hardware, to a support technician on the outside. That support technician can only influence what happens in the industrial network by picking up the phone and asking someone to move the mouse or do things to the, the workstation whose screen they are seeing unidirectionally. There's not physically any way to send mouse movements or keystrokes or any signal back into the protected network. And so to postulate that I've hijacked a remote access session, you know, it doesn't work anymore. There are no remote access sessions, VPN sessions, there's none of that kind of stuff that can be hijacked. And so the unidirectionally protected network does reliably defeat this class of attack. So if we bring up our scorecard, again, we can see that the unidirectionally protected network is pulling ahead. It's not perfect. What's the first law of cybersecurity? Nothing is secure. For every attack, there's a defense. For every defense, there's an attack that will defeat it. But we can use the top 20 as a, a ruler to compare the strength of these two programs by asking which of these programs reliably defeats each of our 20 attacks. And you can see a picture building up here. So that's what I had for you today. Uh, thank you for staying with us through the end here. Uh, a reminder, you know, look below the, the video. It's usually there's a link to the top 20 cyber attacks white paper. You can click there and download if you want to see the entire list of attacks. And hey, you stayed to the end of the video. Do us a favor, give us a like and subscribe. Thanks again.